Now it's time for another Board Game Brawl preview with Nick Meenahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, my name is Nick, this is Board Game Brawl, and today we're going to be taking a look at a game that is currently seeking funding on Kickstarter. That game is called The Seventh Continent, and it's from Serious Pulp Productions. Now, if you like what you see throughout the rest of this preview video, I'm going to encourage you to go to the official Kickstarter project page. You can click on the little icon up in the top corner of your screen that will bring down a little pull down that will have the link and take you to the Kickstarter page. Also, down in the description section of the video will be the link as well that you can copy and paste or click on. It'll take you to the Kickstarter page. I, it'll tell you more information than I could possibly tell you here, and hopefully you'll consider backing the project. Now, what is The Seventh Continent? This is a cooperative game, or a solo game, where you play a person of history back in the, uh, the early 20th century who just got back from exploring this uh, mystical continent called The Seventh Continent, and you have been afflicted by a curse, and now you have to figure out a way to rid yourself or yourselves of this curse. Now, what the mechanism of this game is, it has been described as choose your own adventure in the sense that you have these different exploration cards that you will put out during the course of the game representing new terrain that you are exploring and new random events that may occur to, uh, occur, uh, to you and at you. And you have to resolve all of these different cards by going through another deck of cards called the action deck. And all manner of different things may happen to you. All manner of different, different actions can be taken by you and the other players in order to survive all of these different things and to come out at the end having uh, rid yourself of the curse or have your adventure end by dying horribly. All of these different things can happen. Let me go ahead and give you a brief look at how the game is played with a prototype version of the game so it may change in the final version. Then we're going to come back I'll give you my final thoughts. All right, let me give you a brief overview of The Seventh Continent. Now, this is just a tutorial run of the game, and it's also a prototype version of the game, so what you see here may not be final in the final version of the game. This is just to give you a taste of what to expect as you play. Now, first and foremost, The Seventh Continent can be played as a solo game, or it can be played with up to three other players. The setup that I have here actually has a total of three players. Each player is going to take the character card that they want. It's going to have a special ability on it. So let's go ahead and take a, uh, a quick look at this card. So you have Keelan McCluskey here who has a special ability that she can uh, activate discarding uh, different item cards and such. But you also have uh, in this tutorial mode, you have Ferdinand, La I'm not going to pronounce that name correctly, so that's okay. Uh, Ferdinand here, who also has an ability, uh, and so on and so forth. Well, here, I'll show you the other one that we have here. We have uh, Dmitry Gorchkov. That one I got. Okay, good stuff. <laughs> so every player is going to have their own character, and you are going on an adventure. There has been a curse that has taken place that you must try to overcome. Uh, and this game is a, something of a choose-your-own-adventure game in a way. Now, at the beginning of the game, players are going to choose a curse card, and they're also going to have this shoulder bag here. They're going to put the curse card that you have chosen, and you may choose multiple curse cards if you want a more challenging or a longer game. But for the purposes of this, the one that we've chosen is uh, the Voracious G Goddess. And that will have a little bit of story blurb on it about what's actually happening in the curse that is afflicting you. I won't spoil that. But you'll put that in your shoulder bag, and there's going to be a number of curse cards that you're actually going to shuffle into the action deck as well. The goal of the game is to eliminate these curse cards, but the, you can lose the game collectively, if uh, even if you're playing with multiple players cooperatively. You can lose the game by uh, drawing a curse card after you've already gone through, and uh, you draw it out of the action card uh, discard, or... If all the players of the game have had their adventure be signaled as over, some of the effects in the game will just say your adventure is over. If this happens to all the players, you will also lose. So there's several ways to lose in the uh, game, but there's only one way to win, and that is by eliminating the curse that is afflicting all of you. Now, there are two major kinds of cards in the game. There are action cards, which are the blue cards there, and then there are the exploration cards, which are the green cards with the numbers on top. Uh, these are the different types of cards that you're going to be interacting with uh, the most. And you're going to start the game, Depend. this is again going to depend on the different uh, curses and scenarios that you choose. But for this one, we're going to start the game with uh, this card in play, which was the 001 card. And that's going to have a, different, a little story blurb on top about the start of your adventure. You'll flip this over, put it into play, 
and then you'll put your uh, miniature figures, which again, these are just prototype miniatures, but you'll put the whichever players are involved in the game, and this game does have drop-in, drop-out, so someone can just join in at any time, but you'll put them on this starting card. Now, on the card, there are several different things to note, but more, most importantly at the start, you have these little orange balls with arrows pointing off. Those signify event cards. So you're going to have to draw random event cards, and you're going to put them fog of war side face down in the directions that uh, those arrows on this card are pointing, as long as you have them in the same orientation. So you'll put those face down, and those are random events that you're going to have to deal with before you can put out the next exploration card. See how there are numbers here, 003 and 007? Those will tell you the next exploration cards you want to get to, but first you have to endure those events. Now there's other things you can do on this card as well. In fact, where, when a player gets to their turn, they can choose to interact either with the card, the terrain card that they are on. So when an exploration card is flipped over like this, it's a terrain card. Or they can choose to interact with the events on either side. And there's other things they can do as well. So for instance, if I didn't want to go in one of those directions, I can instead try to go to 005, which is going to require an action on my part. Uh, but let's say, for instance, I wanted to resolve these random events. And it is the blue player's turn because, of course, blue is the best color and that color is going to go first. So <laughs> what this player will do, uh, I'll choose to uh, resolve this event. So I have to flip over this event card. And what this card says is lunch. This is the name of the event. So that doesn't sound so, so bad. Uh, so this is an appetizing seagull is hopping around nearby. If you are a vegetarian, just ignore it. But let's say that you don't ignore it. So now you have to look at the iconography on the card. And this is going to tell you how you can interact with the card. The blue uh, square there, the blue diamond, indicates the number of cards you have to draw from the action deck and try to get an achievement. Achievements are the stars. In this case, you need to try and get two achievements. Now, the lock indicates that you cannot boost this card in order to draw more cards from the deck. Although you may not, you may necessarily not want to do that anyways. Remember that uh, there are cursed cards in the deck, and while it doesn't matter the first time you go through the deck, if you ever have to discard the entire action card deck and then reshuffle and draw again, if you draw a cursed card, it's going to be game over. So you don't want that to happen. But in some cards, you're going to want to draw more action cards just to have more opportunities to get achievements. So let's take a look at what that means. So the blue diamond is telling me I, ha I must draw one action card and I can't boost it. I can't draw more action cards. So I'm going to draw one and I am going to fail. That's because over in the sidebar here, it will tell me uh, how many achievements I get, which are completed stars. Now, this is a, an incomplete star. If I had drawn more action cards, I could possibly link it up with other incomplete stars like this one or let's see this one here. In order to have a complete star, this happens to be one of the character uh, action cards. But since I was only able to draw one, that's it, and I'm actually going to uh, fail that event. There's also some cards that have two achievements on them right then in there. I just wasn't able to get one of those. Now, once I have resolved this and flipped over a card, first off, I actually get to keep one of the idea cards that I was able to flip over. So I'll actually take that card into hand. Now, if players and including other players who are on the same uh, terrain card as me who want to help out if they have those cards from previous rounds they can actually have used those to help me in my journey there in, in my effort so for instance sometimes you don't you'll have a lot of cards that you have to draw as part of the cost of the action you would you don't want to draw that many so if i had previously had this card in hand i could reduce the cost by two which means that's two less cards that i have to draw and the seven is another type of special effect that can happen during the game so that's an important thing to note is that you can use these cards in later turns now once you get done resolving that then you see whether you succeeded or failed now if you have succeeded then i you would banish this card get rid of it from the game back into the game box and you get to take one of these food cards as a consequence but uh, in this case I failed so I have to do what's in the black box which says that the uh, the seagull flies away and then you immediately banish this once you banish that card well now you get to put out a the new exploration card uh, corresponding to whatever that number is so that is the 003 card so you would put out that card and read the bit of story blurb to the other players. The soil is totally barren here. The only plants in the surroundings are branches of uh, bunches of red seaweed over there, puffs of 
uh, smoke keeps spurting from the ground from time to time, uh, swirling around a dead seagull. So then we flip this over, and now the first thing you have to do is look at those arrows again and see which more random event cards you have to put out into free spaces. So I wouldn't put a random event back into the space where we currently are, but I would put them out in over here in this direction. And again, here, always remember uh, maintaining that orientation. And then I can move on to this terrain card. And now I need to, I would want to go, uh, it, the way that the turns work in this game is that I can go again as the blue player or one of the other players can go. You kind of communally agree to this because it is a cooperative game. But do notice that now I can either go in one of those directions or I can try to go for the number 10 card by doing an investigation, which is another type of action. You do have a, a grid that you keep off to the side that lists all the different types of uh, symbols and what they mean and what they do and uh, what they will symbolize. I, I could also, in any of these cards, try to get a stone by taking this action. I could try to go to the card 13 by doing this move action and so on and so forth. So, for instance, let's go ahead and do one of those. So I'm going to do the investigate action up here, which is the magnifying glass. I need to draw one action card, but I don't need to have any achievements in order to succeed. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that card, and then I'll get to take that into hand. Now I have pan pipes. Haha, -ha, aren't you jealous? And then we're going to take the number 10 card. So we're going to dig into the deck, and we're going to grab that number 10. And here we go. So we'll grab the number 10 card. You always get to keep the cards in order so you can get to them quickly, unlike what I just did. <laughs> and the number 10 card says, Bright red seaweed is clinging tightly to the rock. Perhaps it is edible. So notice how all these different story events are uh, seemingly going together. So you'll read the card and resolve its action. You tear a piece of seaweed and give it a taste. As soon as your tongue starts tingling, you spit it out. However, its flexible and strong stem might prove useful. When this seaweed is on the same terrain card as you you get this liana resource so this is something that you get to uh hold on to that you will actually uh put into play as a permanent event so this is actually going to go up here so there's like an arrow there that's pointing down towards the terrain car where you just took the action so that's going to stay there and now you have uh this new permanent event that can give you this resource so now that we've resolved that let's go back and look at those pan pipes so i can break this down a little bit more as to what everything means on the card. So first off, up in the top corner, notice that there's this like craft symbol. And what that means is that if you, um, you can uh, take this action and uh, draw that many action cards, it doesn't, it doesn't need any achievements, you can essentially break this down into its constituent parts. Uh, now also down here, or up in the corner, I mean, you have um, a die symbol. That means that this card only has so many uses. You'll actually put a die onto the card and keep track of how many uses it has before it's no longer any good. And then down here, uh, you can, these, this shows you the different uh, types of actions, the pan pipes, can be used for in order to uh, gain either an achievement or to reduce the cost of an action by minus one. So in this way, the items can be very, very useful uh, in during the course of the game. Let's just go ahead and resolve a couple more cards just so I can give you a, just a little bit more of a taste of what the game is like. I could go on and on. There's quite a bit to this game, but just to give you a taste here. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll just pretend that I'm still playing as the blue character here. And I'm going to try to resolve this event. So let's look at this. Aha. Fumaroles. Fumaroles. So what the fumaroles says are, these are fumaroles. There are fumaroles between you and where you are headed. You notice that those in larger numbers spurt less frequently from the ground. Now, anytime that you see an action symbol, which is always that white box, but it has a, that red border around it, that means it is mandatory and you must do that right away. So in this case, the action that I have to do has a cost of zero and an achievement of zero. So fantastic. I don't need to draw any cards and I don't need any achievements. Instead, I look over here and it says that I have to take either the 34 if I want to go towards the yellow ringed holes or a 35 if I want to go towards the white ringed hole. So I will make my choice. And this looks ominous down here, but let's not worry about that quite yet. So let's say I go ahead and I take the... 35, which means that I want to go towards the white ringed hole. So I'll go ahead and I'll take that card from the deck. And what that says is, I wait for the right moment and rush towards the white ringed holes. The boiling steam does not begin spurting from the ground until you are far away. Then you are going to take one of these experience cards as a reward. However, had I chosen to go to the 34, that would have been worse. You have this uh, temporary event here 
which says you wait for the right moment, rush towards the yellow ring holes, you realize with horror that you misevaluated the situation and quickly find yourself surrounded by jets of steam that severely burn you. However, you manage to run through this obstacle and follow your path. However, you randomly discard an idea card from your hand and all characters involved, if more than one person was involved, gets an injury card. Now let's go ahead and take a look at those two cards that I just mentioned. The first one, the positive one, are the experience point cards, which are like very helpful uh, tips that you can gain during the course of the game. When experience points are gained, whenever you get to your fifth one, you take a fifth experience point card instead. When you gain a tenth one, you gain your ten experience point card instead, and they can be used for powerful effects later on. But they also have tips here. So for instance, it says that if you're bloody, it's harder to fish and hunt. There's also a story blurb as well. Now the injury cards are the opposite. They're just bad, bad news. So this injured card, uh, if you want to try and get rid of it, you can uh, try and do so by taking this cure action, but it may end up being worse for you. So you may not want to do that, but you don't want to take too many injury cards either. So there is that, and boy, I could go on. There's just a lot of stuff to this game. It's pretty addictive to actually go through uh, the exploration cards and to keep adventuring and going forward and forward and forward. But ultimately what your goal is, is you want to get through all of these different exploration cards and you want to get to the point where you can actually uh, get through the events that are going to let you discard the curse cards and save the day before you have to draw those curse cards after going through the entire action deck, which is going to mean your doom or any other kind of nasty events that may befall you and your crew. And by the way, a couple of things I want to point out. I already alluded to the fact that you can have drop in, drop out play where players can come and go from the game if that should be the case, if that needs to happen. Uh, do note that all the different characters, and there will, there will be more in the final version of the game, uh, have all their own special abilities and therefore their own character. And you'll actually add their specific character cards also, as I alluded to, to the uh, action deck. And as well, you might be wondering what these dice cards are here. This is part of the uh, part of the game where you can actually save the game. Because the game may take a while, because there's, the story can be ongoing, you can save the game, quote-unquote, at any point and then continue playing at a later date. These cards are actually going to be used to keep track of the dice position, uh, therefore the durability of the item cards that you have. So there's a lot of really interesting concepts going on in the game that really make it feel uh, not just like a choose-your-own-adventure book, but uh, also like a video game, an exploration-adventure game as well. So that's just a taste of The Seventh Continent. Let's get to my final thoughts. Well, by any standard, The Seventh Continent is most definitely an innovative game. Yes, there have been uh, aspects of board games before this that were choose-your-own-adventure-ish, and certainly when you're playing a campaign style game, like a bigger, more grandiose uh, game, at least as far as the bits, like uh, Descent uh, or, or anything like that, or Imperial Assault, games that have different branching story paths, it can feel like you, uh, as the players cooperating together, are you know choosing your path and going down certain adventures. But it, it is, it's also much more scripted. I mean, there are consequences to what happens, but then you just go on to the next adventure, the next mission, campaign, stop, whatever it might be. In this game, as you play the game, in just one full sitting of the game, or if you save the game and come back to it, you are building the adventure as you go. You are going through all these different exploration cards and choosing your path and trying to go down paths that you think, based on hints and clues that you've gotten over the course of the game, might be best for you in your allotment of abilities, the items that you have, trying your absolute best to survive and get rid of these different curses, which is not an easy thing to do. The whole interaction between the action deck, which represents the life force of your, uh, you and your fellow adventurers. You don't want to run through that deck and then be forced to draw again and get those curse cards, but at times when you are allowed to, you want to draw more action cards in order to gain more access uh, to more cards that will give you more chances at getting achievements depending on how difficult the action is. And of course, you get to keep those cards as well, at least one of them, and uh, use them on future turns. So there's a lot of interesting usages of the cards in this game. I've always said that I enjoy it when a card can be used for multiple things, and that's certainly going on in this game. The whole aspect of the random events and having to deal with those as well, and also uh, having just different branching paths. So you might have an exploration card and be able to go in like three different directions, but also be able to explore that card itself more and try to get um, useful tools and things that will help you out. Uh, the idea of the permanent events that are going to be uh, make like permanent terrain markers and things that might help you or hinder you 
in the future. And then also there's personalization in that every character that you play as, and many of them have been, and many more will be unlocked during the course of the campaign. Um, they all have their own different fields and they all have different special abilities. They all, all have their own different unique action cards that will be thrown into the action deck when you have used them. This just adds a lot of replayability to the game. No game that you play on the Seventh Continent is going to be the same because while some of the cards that you use may be the same, the different paths that you take, the different options that you have, the different items you interact with that make the game either easier or harder or just different, these things are going to change from game to game. And in the full game with the, the huge breadth and scope of cards and different curses and plots and scenarios that you may have to go through, it's going to almost be overwhelming. So, I mean, in all of these different ways, you have to say that The Seventh Continent is just one of the most innovative games that's out there that's, that's pretty much been conceived in all of modern board gaming, at least. So... If this type of thing appeals to you, if you enjoy the idea, the theme the, of going into the unknown, of having these adventures, of working cooperatively together, if you appreciate a game that has good graphic design and art style, which certainly this game has as well, I didn't even really touch on that, you most certainly want to give this game a look. Go to the official Kickstarter page. You don't have to take my word for it. Find out more information than I could possibly tell you here. You can click on the little icon up in the top corner that will bring down the link. You can also go down to the description section right underneath this video that will have the link there as well. Go to the page and hopefully consider, as so many other people have done, backing the project. That is The Seventh Continent from Sirius Pulp. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.